to the Dillweed Society Film Podcast. My name is Max, and my favorite movie is Before Sunrise. Hello, and welcome to the Dillweed Society Film Podcast. <laughs> my name is Vera, and my favorite movie is none other than The American Psycho. <laughs> this is our second time having Vera as a guest. Uh, she is our first second guest which is very wow. special. I'm truly honored to be here, Max, and truly honored to be a part of uh, the Dillweed Society more generally. Yeah, we are very happy to have you. Mm-hmm. I, I have to say there is something sad about this, this uh, podcast episode, though, in that our co-host and the Dilly founder, Bella, is not available today, which is unfortunate, but she will be back next week. Yeah, I look forward to, to hearing more from Bella. She always has the best takes, so we're, we're going to try and do it's our best true. without her. What, what movie did we watch this week, Vera? We watched After Yang. After Yang. Not after before Yin. After Yang. <laughs> after Not Yang. Not to be confused. Aired at Sundance this year um, and got a bunch of buzz from everybody that I, that I knew. It is a science fiction film. Uh, the premise of it, or the description on Letterboxd, is... When his young daughter's beloved companion, an android named Yang, malfunctions, Jake searches for a way to repair him. In the process, Jake discovers the life that has been passing in front of him, reconnecting with his wife and daughter across a distance he didn't know was there. Hmm. What do you think about that as a summary? I think it's an interesting way of portraying it, but it, that didn't feel like the central theme of the movie to me. Like, he, he, is, he is, like, his, his relationship with his family is changing as he kind of goes on this journey and learning more about Yang. But for me, the focus was Yang, right? And, and what he meant to, to them and, and the world that they lived in. Um, I feel like he was the... He was the focus for me. Yeah. Yeah. I, I totally agree with you. The, the second half of that introduction, I feel like, is, is almost wrong. Um, I, I don't know. Uh, it's, so it's, there are four main characters to the film. Um, Yang, uh, who is an android. Colin Farrell, who plays, who plays Jake. Uh, Kyra, his wife. And their daughter, Mika. They also call her Mei Mei at some point. Yeah, I think so. Um, or at least Yang does. Yeah. Early on. But I gotta say, one of my favorite parts of the movie was the title sequence, the intro sequence, mm. where <laughs> they, they kind of warm you up to the fact that you're in a sci-fi world by throwing you into a virtual reality competitive dance competition. <laughs> <laughs> it's really quirky and fun, and I think... Uh, did a, a good job of like establishing the vibe and also being able to show everyone's name that worked on the movie in a way that wasn't super boring. Yeah, you don't get a lot of those like intro credit sequences anymore. Mm-hmm. It's almost I can't ima- I can't remember like the last time I've seen one of those. I liked it. I liked it a lot too. And it it's like it's not even really science fiction at that point. It's just a little bit weird, you know. Yeah, but okay, that's that ties into my thoughts on the movie more generally, which is that it doesn't really feel like science fiction. No. <laughs> it feels like it's almost the exact same world except two things. They have androids that look like humans and no one there's no other technology that's different. That's just the one thing. And they have the hyperloop. They- <laughs> that's it. Those are the two main things that let you know it's sci-fi. But beyond that, it's mostly just sci-fi vibes rather than like cyberpunkness. Yeah. It's like the way that they talk about work or the way that they, um, you know, he, he goes down to Chinatown and the place where he bought the android is replaced by a fish emporium. Like, I, it's just like being quirky in a way that makes you think you're in a cyberpunk world, but they never show you any like uh, really crazy technology. Um, beyond the androids themselves. Yeah. There are little things, too. Like, um, everyone, you know, a lot of the thing is done over, like, video calls. Yeah. And it's but, like... But you... those are in 4-3 ratio. That's <laughs> the, I found that so quirky, too. That the way they communicate you're on a video call is we switch to 4-3 and it's like a grainy camera. 
Um, because I feel like most of the time in sci-fi, when we switch to a video call, like think Star Trek, this is stuff that they, they, that's when they bust out all the special effects and give you a crazy HUD and um, all these different, um, I don't know, just like accents. I, th- I think it was definitely an interesting creative choice to make those like times when they're interfacing tech with t- technology almost more bland than the, the rest of the movie itself. Yeah, I totally agree. The only other thing other than the like graininess and the ratio change is the fact that the the actor is looking right at the camera. Yeah. You know, and all of the video calls are so like, well constructed. It's like, it, it's almost like he, there's one where he's in a restaurant and he's talking to his wife and uh, it's like a perfect shot of all of his food in front of him and him. Uh, it's like they it's like they have cameras built into the walls of the restaurant so people can call yeah. their family. But I, I wonder, you know, if the the increasing prevalence of video calls uh for everybody since the pandemic started had an effect on how we perceive those in movies. Like seeing the actor look directly at you. Mm. I imagine like I don't think happened a lot in earlier films. Yeah, probably not. Yeah. And it, it was, like, more off-putting or more strange, but now it's, it's very normal. Like, we yeah, understand what's because going I on. think before the context of video calls, looking directly at the camera is you're looking at the camera, not, like, the viewer, not, mm-hmm. like, another person in a conversation. But now that we're kind of accustomed to it, being looked at directly by someone on film does kind of just feel like another conversation. Yeah. Yeah. Really strange. And this is, like, this is definitely produced post-pandemic, I think, this this movie. Mm-hmm. Or at least after the start of the pandemic. But... Mm, the world feels quite normal. It feels quite normal. And I think that was another interesting choice, that all the things that are weird about Yang are not just weird to us. They're also weird to the characters in the movie. Mm. It's like... The, it also feels that we have some proximity to the humans in the movie because they're also confused by what's going on. It's like, it's not a society where people have come to terms with the fact that AI can have emotions or that they're sentient or that blah, blah, blah. They're still thought of as robots. And when Yang starts to behave in a way that makes them doubt that and they're like going through his memories and going... This, this dude was experiencing, you know, this is, <laughs> there was a soul or something going on. Yeah. It's as much of an existential crisis for them as it is uh, supposed to be for us. I don't know. Yeah. It's, it feels, it, it's just, it seems very atypical for sci-fi to do something like that. Absolutely. Yeah, it, it does not feel, um, it definitely feels like the, the characters and you are not are not incredibly different from each other. Yeah. I Did you ever see the movie Her? I think maybe. It I, has I saw I saw um if not all of it, some of it. It has Joaquin Phoenix in it, right? I, I have a mental image. Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They talked about it on Hello Internet. I remember. <laughs> <laughs> the the second most foremost film podcast. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. See, I kept, um, <laughs> I kept making terrible predictions throughout <laughs> After Yang. I thought it was going to go in so many different directions than it did. First, they take Yang to um, Brothers and Sisters, which is the apple of this world. They're selling um, you know, uh, <laughs> these androids, and there's no right to repair, and you bring them there, and they say, okay, uh, you know, we can't fix them, but we'll, we'll turn his head into, like, a mantelpiece for you <laughs> and, and take all the data and, you know, sell that to advertisers, whatever. Yeah. Then they go to the next guy, and he's like, it's all a conspiracy, you know? And he's, like, he's woke as heck. So then I'm thinking, oh, that's, this is, that's what this movie is about, yeah. is, is spyware and um, the, the, <laughs> the thought that people are so ready to accept like useful technology that they're not scared enough about it um but then that's not where the movie goes at all and he takes it to a a museum um i I say it when i mean yang which is weird yeah he takes yang's body (laughs) he takes yang's body to a museum and 
uh, well, spoiler alert. Uh, do we do we have anything else to say prior to? I don't know. So, um, in the first five minutes, um, something yeah, something happens to Yang. That's basically it, and that's yes. that the movie is responding to that. The title makes that pretty clear. I would say, um, mm-hmm. the yeah, I think that other things. I, I would say yeah, watch this movie. It's available on on a couple different services, but um, I think that it was pretty exciting i think that it was a very beautiful movie just to end up our our general conversation before we talk about the the spoilers mm. um were there any like general thoughts that you had about it that, as to yes. whether somebody should like see it yes okay so i would say that it was very beautiful one thing that ties into the reason i say that is there there was at one point a saying i don't know from where that some of the best CGI is CGI you don't notice. Yeah. And I think that that was probably true, but that was that was more for like subtle stuff. What what when this what made me really happy about this movie is that when they did choose to use CGI, CGI it looked very very nice. And you know the scene that I'm thinking of. I have, um yeah. So they they kind of held back a lot and then they kind of um poured it all out at once and I think that the way that they utilized CGI very uh it 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 blended well with the rest of the movie and it was also just very pretty and not something you really expect to see in a blockbuster movie Mm -hmm. um just it it almost felt like a like an animation or I I don't know some some little art project it it was a very uh unique CGI as far as 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 films go (laughs) yeah you know it felt like i the professional renders for like video game trailers Mm -hmm. you know um they're always so much more polished than than the actual games themselves but they're also so creative too you know like i think the the animators for video games really enjoy getting to play with the artifacts of the medium Mm -hmm. um and this felt much like that there was so much uh artistry in how they chose to use uh their their cgi skills Mm -hmm. and how they played with like how cgi looks when it's being developed and when it's imperfect uh i thought that that was it was really cool to see and i totally agree with you i think that was a great thing to bring up definitely i think the only reason i would not recommend the movie is because i don't feel that the plot was particularly riveting it was a beautiful movie and one that had interesting themes to explore and you know uh was able to like capture the life of this android in a really beautiful way mm. but simultaneously part of the part of the reason i kept going down those false predictions was i kind of wanted something dramatic to happen <laughs> and not not much not many dramatic things happened throughout the movie and that's 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 a, a personal criticism, but it's also, I think it affects what I look for when I want to be entertained by media. Totally. So should we get into the plot then? Totally, schmodally. Let's do it. After taking Yang to the conspiracy theorist, mm-hmm. uh, the main character consults with a person who works at a museum for cybernetic humans. Mm-hmm. And she says that Yang Yang had these parts in him that were special, that were made illegal, uh, that were like incredibly interesting. Yeah. So specifically, she says that they were uh, an outdated technology, part of a, a very old trial program, wherein they were trying to study what experiences androids would find me- memorable enough to quote-unquote remember to save but that the research itself got shut down very quickly because of privacy concerns which i thought was funny because there's no way it would <laughs> it never happens, like it never happens. <laughs> um, uh, but but it was um you know it's at that point that we then make the realization that oh okay it's not uh the conspiracy we thought it was necessarily yeah. it's just um it's, he's just a, an older android than we realized and has gone under the radar for a long time. Um, I don't think I, I fully realized that until they start exploring his memories more directly. And then you really get a peek into just 
how long he's been alive, um, which is interesting because I, he, he presents as like a 20-something, maybe 30, I don't know. Young, yeah. Young, yeah. A, just a young man. Yeah. And I think it's, it's kind of unintuitive to us to see, even though logically knowing he's a robot, that someone that looks like that could be a, you know, a few hundred years old. <laughs> Um, and I think that's, that also uh, ties into the assumptions that Jake makes. Yes. That's his name. Hold on. I, me, I can't say I remember all the characters. His name is names. Jake. Okay. His <laughs> name is Jake. <laughs> I, I think the point that I really realized that was when they were interviewing his previous owner. Mm-hmm. And they were like, yeah, we got him, we got him used, but he was certified. Yeah, um, which is the same thing that Jake says exactly. early on in the movie. Um, and it's just how many times has that happened? Um, All of them thought that it was a new robot. Like he thought that it had only mm-hmm. been owned for five days. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But I don't know. I just, I, I feel like the conclusions that the movie draws are relatively unsurprising. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> it, not that that's like a, a bad thing. It's just like, yeah, I don't know. You let a android experience things for two hundred years. He's gonna fall in love. <laughs> exactly. I don't know. <laughs> it, yeah, it was it was an incredibly sentimental film, almost to the point of being saccharine. You know, it, like it was just. It was one of those movies that keeps hitting you over the head with like, great beautiful truths for the last half hour of the film, you know? What do you mean? (laughs) Like, like, no, you know what I mean. Like, great, beautiful truths. What, what, what the film feels are great, beautiful truths, to be clear. Not, not necessarily what I feel, but like, the, it's like, oh, you know, he was in love and then he felt, you know, he couldn't find her because she died and then he fell in love with her clone and love persists through generations and then Mm -hmm. also like oh he he was an older brother to uh what what's her name to uh to mika mika Mm -hmm. and like he he just enjoyed the experience of spending time with her and he would tell people about about her Mm -hmm. uh and like oh you know what does it mean to look at someone's memories and, and see yourself through their eyes and see what they see themselves as. Isn't that yeah. beautiful? Like, I, I would say some of that. the more poignant um, shots in the film are the ones where he is, uh, where Jake is going through Yang's memories, seeing the, the specific like five second videos that um, Yang chose to store mm. and then remembering the moments where he saw Yang recording that memory yeah and the kind of uncanny valley behavior that yang exhibits in those moments where he kind of goes deadpan for a second as he's storing the memory mm. did, did you notice that facial okay. expression as well I, I i gotta say that after that played yang did an incredible job Ooh. because even in that first flashback scene with mika you can tell that like the the way he speaks is both eloquent and like very human but also just like slightly different in like a way that's like really hard to articulate i think he really nailed the performance yeah absolutely he's he's like so human and yet so pre um preordained like pre-written almost the way Mm -hmm. that he talks but in terms of the structure of the movie i think that that had a big effect on on why i sort of i didn't feel like it was perfect towards the end Mm -hmm. was just how many times they they sort of explored things which were individually beautiful about his life um, or about like the experience of him as an android uh, it felt like it just had like kept having different climaxes until the last minute of it really Mm -hmm. Um, or until the last scene rather Uh, it it reminded me a lot of um, World of Tomorrow yes but I found World of Tomorrow's frightening and grotesque parts <laughs> like more interesting to continue exploring than the yeah. beauty the beauty which is exploring that's this. that's that's what i i mean when i say that it uh like it felt uneventful because mm. it was like 
it was a long movie and you compare that to world of tomorrow which is only 15 minutes and that still manages to explore probably more themes in a, a really short period of time i just feel like they had a lot of opportunities to to ask more interesting questions than to just show how cool it is to be an android and, and how uh, humans have a bias towards non-human intelligence like not not that it's like <laughs> i don't know I, I i still like it i just think they could have done more with it personally yeah. i felt like the the themes that it was exploring were often about how like what it would be like to look at a human I thought that in exploring Yang's memories, it made him feel more human, and it made me think about what, you know. Yeah, because it it fun it it forces you to question like, okay, what am I if not just a collection of memories? Yeah, I think that's that was at the core of what they were doing by just showing us a bunch of memories. Is because at the end of the day, most of us really can only point to memories as being things that we actually identify with ourselves. Mm -hmm. So I think for Jake in the movie that's that's what makes it existential for him is knowing ah you know he when he drinks tea it goes slurpy slurp down his food hole but he also has memories you know isn't that cute you know <laughs> <laughs> yeah that it was you know it made me think about what what it would be like for a human to have to look at a human's memories I imagine not that different. It, you know, I mean. it, it yeah. also reminded me of, I, and I mentioned this to you as we were watching it, but that Black Mirror episode I can never remember the name of. The entire history of you. That one, exactly. Where they have this implant that records all of their memories and, you know, and then someone cheats on someone and they're going back through their memories and uh, blocking each other. Or maybe that's a different episode, but you know what I mean. Oh, yeah, that's two episodes, because Black Mirror only has, like, three gimmicks, and it just keeps <laughs> repeating them over and over again. Yeah. <laughs> this was, like, Glittery Mirror. This was, like... like glittery like, Mirror. <laughs> <laughs> it was, yeah, I, I, I think it is, on some level, very refreshing to have sci-fi that is not really dystopian. Mm -hmm. um, it, it is kind of dystopian in the way that they talk about work. For a minute, I started. I I was wondering, like, uh, if they if they bought Yang as kind of like a caregiver in their absence because they had to work so much, right. and I think that might have played a part in it. But we didn't really get a whole lot of context for like why they have to work so much or like what it what their society looks like more broadly. I mean, his, Jake's job is uh, to to run a, a tea shop. Um, and we don't know what his wife's job is, only that it's seemingly more professional and that she's taking meetings and blah, 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 blah. Yeah, she works a lot. She has deadlines. But she's... I don't know if they have to work a lot. Like, he just takes off work all the time. It's true. He does take off, like, three or four days just to, to go on this kind of quest of finding... Figuring out how to fix Yang, right? So he, I don't know. He's not working for that whole period of time. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I don't think. If they work a lot, I'm not sure that the movie wants us to think about that. I don't think it does. I think it, pretty much the entire society they live in is obscured. Almost the entire focus of the movie for me is just the people in it, and. The, and the relations they have with each other. There's almost no no emphasis on the, the world that they're a part of. There are almost no unnamed characters on screen in mm -hmm. the entire film. I think that's like the thing that, that makes this feel like it's not sci-fi mm. to me. Like every sci-fi film I can think of is either incredibly out there, sci like sci-fi uh, uh, environment setting, or you get to see how people's lives are different in this other world. So, like, you have 2001, which is a bottle film, but obviously, like, it's way different than living normally in, in, on Earth. Mm. Or you have, like, Blade Runner, which ha shows a society which is different from our own. Like, yeah. this one is so similar to our own, and we don't get to see any of, the, any of the ways how it's different through the lens of, like, society as a whole. We do learn that there's cloning technology, that's just sort of like dropped in. Yeah, but I feel like, uh, I don't know, it kind of, it goes hand in hand with the androids where we kind of have these, you know, diet humans 
it's just like yeah they're like they it makes sense i don't know if you have androids you have quans <laughs> It seemed, yeah, like, pretty realistic. It just, I just didn't understand much of the incentive. It would seem like a, you know, and, and this is probably why they don't explore it that much, but wouldn't an Android of that complexity be, like, more expensive than a, a car or a house, almost? And, you know, and then what, who chooses to clone themselves? Or uh, in, the, in, the, in the movie, it seemed like that woman uh, died prematurely she was hit in a car crash or something yeah and someone cloned her even though did she choose to be cloned i don't know there's just not much explanation given there yeah if we're like filling in the blanks i do think the surveillance state aspect is like a very good blank like filler for that blank which is like oh the reason why the androids cost so little is because they're harvesting all of the information about your your family i think that is definitely like I don't know. It make I wanted to believe the conspiracy guy because yeah. why else would the brothers and sisters people say we'll give you a thousand dollars credit on a next model if you let us harvest the core and all of its memories? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I don't know. I I also didn't understand like why Yang's model was so particularly different. You know, they mentioned that he has this weird, you know, adapter cable in him and that he's storing memories. But how on earth could any android work without memories? Like, it just doesn't make sense to me that you could even have a functional android if they're not storing information about their day-to-day -day life and recording yeah. videos and such. So uh, that, that also seemed like, uh, how is this surprising to you? What do you mean? He has to be recording. <laughs> <laughs> like, Google Home already is, and, and, and that's not even trying to be smart. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. That's so true. I don't know. Yeah, that's a really good question. They don't make you think about that at all. I'll say, I'll, I'll switch back to something really positive, I have to say, which mm -hmm. is that um, in the memories that we get from Yang, you get a very distinct impression that he's looking at things and saving memories about things that he finds interesting. And it gives you this kind of like childlike view of the world again, mm -hmm. which I totally fell in love with as I was watching it. You know, there's just the the reason that there are so many beautiful shots is because it's told from the perspective of someone that is looking for visually interesting things and like things that are different and noticing the things that are different and then taking a mental screenshot of the things that are different and I don't know that really resonated with me and um, made me uh, just reminded me to to try and look for such things in my own day to day life yeah. Um, one shot in particular, which I loved, was when he's looking in the mirror at his uh, previous owner's house, and it's actually like an art installation mirror. It's like a bunch of chopped up mirrors that reflect him in slightly different ways. Mm. And he's just like noticing all the different ways that he's reflected, and it's really good and pretty. Yeah, I like that too. I think that's a really good like in-universe in explanation for why it's so, such a pretty movie. I, I think that it, it it made sense to me because, you know, as part of, uh, like, that is part of what humanizes him to me. Yeah. What makes him more relatable is the fact that the things that he latches onto and the things that he does remember are the more interesting ones, you know? And it's some, sometimes it's puzzling and you have to wonder, like, why did he find this moment so impactful? It'll be just like a like a single cup of coffee or I don't remember a specific one, but like the single butterfly. Yeah. You know, I, I loved that. his butterfly collection. I thought that was so cute. <laughs> like why does he need, he doesn't need a butterfly collection. It's, it, it's not for anybody else. It's mm -hmm. just for him. Everyone should have a butterfly collection. And the way that he sort of like, he has these moments where he wants to bring up like Chinese history. Cause that's what he's, pre-programmed to talk about or to know about yeah but it's not it doesn't feel like he's being taken over it just feels like a genuine thing that he knows about and that he thinks it's like his hyperfixation. it's like yeah. what he wants to tell people <laughs> <laughs> it's like did you know <laughs> <laughs> That's, it's true um speaking of pre-programmed um i think for me one of the most impactful scenes in the movie is when he's speaking to jake's wife mm. um about what happens after death and they play this this memory for us 
right after she stumbles onto his butterfly collection again, and she's thinking back to uh, the first, when, when she saw him accumulating more. And this is all happening right after we witness um, his kind of official death and they're kind of mourning him. Um, you know, they, they finally kind of reveal to Mika that Yang isn't gonna turn back on and it's a sad moment. And then they, they play this dialogue between Yang and, what's her name? Hold on, hold on. We're editing this I'm on out. It. I'm on it, hold on. They play this dialogue between Yang and Kyra. And Kyra, yes. Um, and, and she is like initially confused by like some of his, his um, like how does it go? Does it, who starts the conversation? Because they, they're, they're, they're talking about a butterfly. And then they talk about the caterpillar. And he quotes Lao Tzu and says, for the caterpillar, death is also a beginning. Well, to, the end is also a new start. Something like that. The, what, what a caterpillar calls death, everybody else calls a butterfly. Yes. Yeah. Ah, such a good one. And she, she likes that. And she's like, I like that one. Um, and that's how they start talking about, um, you know, do you think the same is true for us? Do you think the same is true for humans or for androids? Um, and he says he's not concerned about what will happen after death. But he, it's also interesting because he has the self-awareness to say, I might just be pre-programmed that way. Yeah. I might just, I might just, that might just not be in my code to wonder about such things. Mm. Um, and then she starts talking about how she would like to believe that there is something. And then he has a very emotional moment where he says, I don't mind if there's nothing mm. after death and actually cries, which is, I think, the only time in the movie we see him cry. If that were the climax of the movie, I would feel very happy about it. Do you not feel like it was? I felt like... I thought that that was when it happened. And then after that, there was more. There was more. There was like, what if, we, what if we also made it about the way that love transcends generations or whatever? Yeah. Uh, and that was like, I don't know, the, the attempt to make the movie about everything. Well, I understand that, that it's applicable for all of these. I think that all of them together sort of cheapened the effect of the ending. Mm -hmm. For me, for me. Experience. And what, what was the ending? How did it end? Well, the last thing that they talk about is his life with the, the woman with blonde hair. Mm -hmm. And the, the way that he... Or the last thing that they sort of found out was that he knew her great aunt. Yeah. And um, she didn't know this. And she didn't know that. Even though she was a clone of her. Um, Yang never told her that he knew her original yeah. Ada was her Ada. Name. Great name. It's a fantastic name. It's a good com it's a good sci-fi name. Yeah, because it's a computer, right? Uh yeah, it was well, I think it's all named after Ada Lovelace. Ah, like Ada the yeah, yeah, yeah. language is is named after her. That makes sense. Yeah. But yeah, the ending, the scene in the woods where she's disappearing. Or where she disappears behind the tree. That really threw me off, as you know. <laughs> I know. Where'd she go? <laughs> I thought she. I, I thought they were gonna pull something like she was a ghost, or she was just like a, a figment of his imagination, and he was an android the whole time. Uh. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they did not throw any such no. twists at us, um, but uh, I I think you cleared it up by saying that he was just taking multiple different walks through the woods and they and they cut them together in an interesting way which is what they do throughout the entire film it is i okay you're now making re me remember the something part. my favorite i will i don't know you say thinking, your th you say your thing and i'll tell you if it's what i'm thinking my favorite thing was the the use of repetition in the in the memories that he has um <laughs> ding 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 ding, ding, ding. <laughs> <laughs> because it it's, it, it gives you like a really cool, um, 
it, it for some reason it does capture like a non-human way of experiencing the world because you see the same exact like uh series of words right it'll be something about like uh i don't know if i love tea or i don't know if i love the taste of tea and then it'll be the same line from a different angle and a different um perspective voice. and a different voice and it'll it'll just be the same line over and over again a few times um I feel like that also did an amazing job of capturing what felt significant to Yang. Right. And that was always, I guess, that was always in the human memories. All of, the, all of Yang's memories were quite steady, whereas all of, all of the human's memories had multiple interpretations of the same mm. sentences and overlapping uh, I guess so. All of, the, all of the Yang memories were just almost like video files. Mm-hmm. Whereas to them, like the example, it would, he would say like, I don't know if I love the flavor of tea. And then he would say, he would say I, I don't know if I love the flavor of tea. Yeah. You know, it would be, just be like slightly different, like two different yeah. performances where the director said like, can you take it this way? <laughs> Which I'm sure is probably part of how it was, <laughs> how it was recorded. Yeah. And that's true of, of memories. Like you can remember mm-hmm. certain things, and then other parts are malleable or can be reimagined in different ways. If anything, maybe that indicates that Yang was more human because he had a more accurate memory. And if all we base our egos around is memories, well, we don't have a very good record keeping system, do we? Our ego is so, yeah. <laughs> it's like it's based on false information or, or reinterpreted information that's that style was so striking it was i just i loved the the way that they chopped it up and overlaid it with the repeating audio and and those those were some of my favorite scenes same here i i would recommend this movie to people for that just to see the stylistic effect of that alone yeah i would agree i yeah. think that it it had a very unique flavor as a movie, and that it's it's worth tasting, even if you uh, even if you don't want to go back for seconds. I don't know. Yeah. Can you tell me his neighbor? Mm. Did his neighbor have android children and an android wife, or were they clone children and a clone wife? Clone children and the two daughters. The, yeah. The twin daughters would like act the exact same. Yeah. Because they were clones of the same person. I think all of his children were clones. But I found it interesting that Jake was judgmental of that. It was interesting. Like, I don't understand why, but it was just like a quirk, I guess. Yeah, but, you know, why is he, like, the sci-fi version of racist? Like, you know, what does he have against clones? It just didn't make much sense to me. Yeah, like, they, they didn't give a reason why. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> just checking. It was a little bit cyberpunk in, like, the use of, like, Japanese and American culture syncretism. Like, with, with the, the, I thought the, what's it called, shop? The, um... The tea shop? Yeah, the tea shop is part of it. But oh, also, the fish shop. The fish shop and the yeah. tea shop together are, like, the two. They felt very, like, cyberpunk, as well as the, um... The yeah, but guy. I feel like what yeah. you're you're describing is just like a you know a cultural melting pot, not necessarily like the other themes we associate with cyberpunk. No, yeah, it was entirely that, and like that. You know, you, you have to admit that that's a part of cyberpunk. Is, is of course, yeah, Chinese, Japanese, and American. You like, think Blade Runner? It's like psh, he walks outside, Japanese text. You know, it's sci-fi <laughs> <laughs> and neon lights. It's like New York. Yeah, yeah, it's like New York, but worse. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's funny because I think Blade Runner set in in um, Los Angeles, but really, it feels well. That like... actually makes more sense. <laughs> Los Angeles is already hellish, like yeah. Blade <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Blade Runner is is the past. It's not the future. <laughs> A long time ago. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's funny because Blade Runner is set in LA. I could not tell you where this is set at all no they didn't give us any hints or when this is set no they say it was in the 20th century they were talking about a movie yeah um, no they think they, they reference um, this movie that that got 
Jake to fall in love with T and he's like, oh, it's such an ancient movie. It was a 20th century film. <laughs> and like, clearly you wouldn't say that if it was the 21st century. Yeah. Unless it was like really late in the 21st century, I guess. Like the, the 90s, the, the 2090s. I don't know. Yeah, my guess is that it's at least 150 years from now. It's quite similar to today though. In a way that I I, I can't imagine 150 years from now will look like. I don't know. I um, I don't really have a a a desire to interact with an android in that way. I think like we have like this idea that good AI has to look like a person and talk like a person and feel like a person, but I'm cool with I'm cool with the terminal personally. Yeah, with the text chat. You gotta meet them halfway. We, we, we have all these tools for interfacing with computers already. It just seems like reinventing the wheel to put them on a, a giant mecha too. <laughs> Need to make them look like humans. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I agree. I get that's not what Yang was made for though. So yeah. it's a bit of a different story. It's not what the, it wouldn't have made the movie very good. No, no. no if it, it was like a, <laughs> it's like a, text prompt I don't know I, I just it seems strange that he would even need to be so advanced on the software side to perform the duties that he has on the uh, you know on the physical side I feel like if you put GPT-3 in Yang's body it could have done all the same things for Mika and for the rest of them yeah with the like pre-prompt that's like yeah. incorporate I don't know would you like to hear a fun fact about grafting you know (laughs) as sci-fi goes what did you think do you like the genre of sci-fi or do you prefer more like out there sci-fi I I like it because it's subversive by not being totally awful (laughs) like it's subversive just by not like being a hellscape yeah Um, by being like optimistic (laughs) yeah which which is refreshing and I, I do think we should see more of that that explore like some of the more beautiful sides of like what technology could mean in the future cool um but it didn't feel like a flushed out genre unto itself if that makes sense like i I don't know how much how much else you could make in that style what other themes you could explore her is good her is quite similar to this in Mm. terms of like the the science fiction aspect of it but see, I need I need something with like ex machina flavors to it. Oh, I need I need them to fall in love machina. and then get killed. You know, yeah. I need I need it to be both ways. Personally, that's, I yeah, that's like what we're missing, right? Is is something frightening and beautiful at the same time? Yes. Yeah. Um, that's when sci-fi shines for me. That's when most media shines for me. <laughs> that's what Kant called the sublime. That's like. His <laughs> <life>. <laughs> Not you bringing up Kant. <laughs> <laughs> they took me so long to figure out what he actually meant by that. I, I have to share it with everybody. Something okay. which is like frightening. It's so so the sublime, impressive, and beautiful that it's frightening and it's hard to look at. Mm. Uh, so code, code, yeah, big code bases. <laughs> um, uh, enterprise level buffunge. <laughs> <laughs> That's not a thing. It's not a thing. Oh gosh. Well, we're getting a bit derailed. We are. Um, how, how would you rate Yang? You want me to go first? I do want you to go first. Okay. We're, we're doing a five-star system. Five-star system. You can only do half-star increments. Okay. I am stuck. I am going to say that I would rank this film four and a half. A light, wow. four, a light four and a half is I'm, my opinion. I'm impressed. Yeah, I would want to say 4.25. Like, exactly in the middle of four and four and a half. But I, I would say four and a half. I'm going to bump it up. You're making me reconsider. I was going to say... Why, that's yeah, why I didn't yeah. want to go first. What do you think? I was going to say 3.5. Okay. Which is, it's okay. higher than average. Halfway between, you know, we're, halfway is two and a half stars. Right? right. Halfway, for me, two and a half stars is take it or leave it. Right? For, for me, the plot felt take it or leave it. Mm-hmm. But it made up for that. Um, and added to that with all of the beautiful visual shots and the interesting kind of like, you know, some different version of alternate universe for Wes Anderson director style. 
um, that that added a lot of flavor with the repetition and the you know the 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 different ways that they captured the world, combined with the nice CGI and the the other um, all, all the other things I've mentioned. I think that bumped it up for me. It just wasn't um, the most compelling piece of media I've ever seen in my life. So yeah, it stays at three point five for me. I totally understand that, um, and I think I agree with you about all the things. Just the the experience that I had watching it was a very, it, until the last 25 minutes was a very four and a half um, hmm. experience. And then you I think, sort of, you think something in the, in the last 20 minutes or so uh, detracted for you? Yeah, I think the, the, the multiple landings that the film made uh, got tiresome for me. I think, I, I understand what you're saying, but also it's during that final period of time in the movie that we see uh, Jake open up the alpha file, right? No. No? Is that earlier on? Oh, the alpha file, the first one. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. That's like, that's the point at which it starts doing all the endings. Yeah. 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 So it's revealing that Yang has existed for much longer than we ever thought, you know. He looks at the alpha, or he looks at the gamma and the beta but they're tiny compared to the alpha. It has all the experiences he's <laughs> stored up in the alpha. And it's um, supposed to be overwhelming and grandiose. It was. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was, definitely. And I don't think the ending is, is unredeemable. It hit me too much, too many times. Got boring. I get that. They did kind of drive the same theme home too many times. Yeah, I would totally recommend people see it, though, for all of the things that we said for all the, yes. the like interesting aesthetic things, the world building, the mystery at the beginning as well, I thought it was really fun to follow. Like it was very gripping for the first hour. The yes. Movie. There's something Jake says at the very end, which is he's debating whether to give the body to, to the museum and memories and stuff. He says, I don't want him on display, but I want his memories to be studied mm -hmm. because he, his existence mattered. And I would say the same thing is true for this movie, which is its existence mattered. It was, a, it was a, a worthwhile movie to see, and one that I think is notable, just not my favorite movie. Yeah. You can watch this movie on uh, Showtime, and you can also watch it on Paramount+. Plus. And you can also watch it on... <laughs> <laughs> yes. Always an option. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, yeah. So after that, uh, I guess we can move on to the, uh, to the next section. Hello, I hope you're enjoying this wonderful podcast that Max and Vera recorded. Unfortunately, I couldn't be there for this one, but they're hearing my voice now, so you know what that means. If you are not a Dilly associate at this point, what are you doing with your life? You get to nominate and vote on films, and we're currently in our nomination stage, so get on it. If you go to apply.dillysociety.com, it takes you right there. It's completely free. It takes two seconds. Email me if you have any complications or email me if you just want to talk about movies um i obviously love movies and find all the other active information on our website dealweedsociety.com that's about it enjoy the rest of this beautiful podcast so welcome to recommendations <laughs> <laughs> all right so in the second half of the show we, uh, as, as Vera and I already know, because we, we've already done the podcast before. Oh, for sure. We do. <laughs> <laughs> recommendations for TV shows, movies, YouTube videos, anything, uh, video media, which has come out this year. Continue? Yeah. Uh, normally what we do is we sandwich the guest recommendation between Bella and my recommendations, but as we only have one guest and one host today... Uh, would you like to go first for your recommendation, Bear? Sure. Um, so I would recommend to listeners to watch Severance. It's available on Apple TV. It is... If you watch the first episode, which is available for free, I think you will get an impression of whether you're interested or not. And it's one of the better TV shows that I've seen recently. It's uh, really well done visually they have a lot of interesting themes they're exploring and the acting is really good and it just keeps you on the edge of your seat uh you always want to click play on the next one because there's um there's constantly interesting stuff happening um and the plot progresses at uh, it's very well paced and 
overall, I'm, I'm, I'm really happy with what they did in that season, I'm an ex- and I am excited to see more from them. Yeah, I'm, I'm part of the way through that show, and I really enjoy it. It's, it's so gripping. It is a sci-fi show about um, people that go to a job where their memories are split. <laughs> it's kind of hard to explain uh, without seeing it because it's through the way that they portray it that you kind of get a better understanding of what they're experiencing, these characters on the show. Mm. Um, but when you're at work, you can only remember things that you've done at work. And when you're at home, you can only remember things that you've done outside of uh, work. So you just have basically two consciousnesses Mm. in the same body. Um, And it it ends up leading to some really uh, freaky stuff going on. So highly recommend. Super freaky. And that's starring um, Adam Scott is the name of the actor? Adam Scott. Scout? Scott. I, no, Scott. It's funny because his last name in the show is quite similar. It's Scout. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, who, he's in Parks and Rec. He's Ben Wyatt in Parks and Rec. And I haven't seen him in anything else, but he was really cool in this. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He, he gives a compelling performance, I would say. As, do, right. as do the other uh, characters. I, I gotta say, you haven't, you haven't even seen the half of it. I know I haven't. I've only <laughs> seen three episodes of it. Okay, now, Max... What is your recommendation for the people of the Dillweed Society? Okay, it's funny, because it's kind of similar. It is also an Apple TV science fiction TV Uh-oh. show. Ted Lasso? <laughs> it's Ted Lasso. <laughs> I'm going to recommend <laughs> that everyone watch Ted Lasso, season three. <laughs> it's, um, I'm going to recommend Foundation. Oh, yeah. Which is an adaptation of uh, one of my favorite science fiction books. Uh, it is just a really out there, bonkers science fiction TV show uh, and book that feels it feels like it it uses all of the things that are in it to their fullest potential. There's a lot of weirdness in it, uh, but the weirdness is all explored very well and is like fun to see play out. It does not feel like anything is left just hanging there. Uh, to be there for its own sake. It's about a group of people who predict the end of the Galactic Empire. It was like way out in the future. And they uh, form a colony at the edge of the universe to try and make Wikipedia, basically. (laughs) They want to write down all the knowledge that people have figured out uh, so that it doesn't get lost when the the Galactic Empire falls in the next like some thousand of years or so, whatever. And it's all, quite good. All the drama. There's so much drama. I do, I do love the drama. Um, still haven't finished that one, but quite good. Yeah. I big recommend. And I'm pretty sure the first episode is free as well because it's yes. Apple TV. It's a very science fiction afternoon today on the Daily Definitely. Podcast. Yeah. You got the trifecta, holy trinity of science fiction right now. <laughs> well, well, Onamute, thank you all for joining us. It's always a pleasure to have you on the podcast. Oh, right? it's always a pleasure to be here, don't you know? <laughs> and we will, you will hear us again next week on the Dillweed Podcast. I hope you have a great week. Buenas noches. Thanks for listening. Adios. <laughs>